Hi, I'm Becky Mitchell from the Becker County Museum. Welcome to the Museum Roadshow. Today's show is about uh, Ken Larson. We interviewed him in 2014, and he is going to share his experiences from World War II on a submarine. I'm uh, Kenneth Larson. I was born on uh, April 12, 1925. I was born and uh, raised in uh, Oaks, North Dakota, and have, I have been living in Pelican Rapids now for about 40, 45 years. I went in the Navy when I was 17 years old. Went to Fargo, Idaho for my training. And uh, while there, my buddy talked me into going into submarines. He had to volunteer for submarines. Oh, it was a big deal. He said, you got 50% more pay and all this. So I said, okay, we'll give it a try. So after we got through in Farragut, they sent us to New London, Connecticut for our submarine training. And right then they put you through a lot of diving chambers and uh, see if you could stand the pressure and see if you could stand to be cooped up. And, uh, put you at the bottom of a tank that's 100 foot deep and make you go up to the top uh, with what they call a Munson lug, which is designed to get you out of a submarine if it's in shallow enough water. But anyway, the kid I talked me into going, he flunked out right away. <laughs> that was the end of him. This kid and I were run around together since we were first grade. And we went in the Navy and he had bad ears so they put him in the CBs, which is uh, uh, build, uh, buildings, uh, build airports and stuff. And he was sent out in the island building airports and I went my way. I didn't get home for two and a half years at all, you know. And never seen the kid. And when we come back into Frisco, they sent us to Minneapolis to be discharged, or Wool Chamberlain Field. And I pulled in there in the middle of the night, and they put us in this big room and said, find a bunk that's empty and crawl in. So I did, and I woke up in the morning, and that kid was in the bunk below me. <laughs> and here, this summer, him and his wife, we stood up for each other's weddings. We've been together ever since. But we went through our school there, and uh, some of us were assigned to a new boat right there. A submarine's never a ship, it's a boat. And some of them were assigned to a boat right there, but I was, I was not and went out to uh, Pearl Harbor. There I went through more schooling on workings of the uh, electrical panels and on a submarine. And I was there about another six weeks probably and then a boat came in that I got assigned to, that had a brand new boat. I got on that and I think that was about in, uh, I don't know, September or so in uh, 44. It happened to be that there was after a dozen guys that I'd went to school with on that boat, so I was lucky I knew somebody. And the name of the submarine I, I was on was the USS Blackfin, a number 322, built in Groton, Connecticut. Of the 200 submarines in service, 52 of them got sank. But I was just reading one of the things I had. The submarine service was 1.6% of the Navy, but we sank 30% of the Japanese fleet and 55% of the Japanese merchant ships sank with 1.6% of the personnel. So we done a lot of damage, but we lost a lot of boats. We call it a diesel electric boat and it's uh, 310 feet long, about 35 feet wide, and uh, it had four big diesel engines, two batteries 
Each battery had uh, two, uh, 120 cells. Each battery cell was about five foot high and two foot square. And we a battery uh, big enough to run 400 horsepower motors. That's a pretty good sized batteries. And we could stay submerged up to 12, 15 hours. But at, at when we're submerged, we could only travel about two knots. Otherwise, we'd use up all the battery. Uh, but we had to keep moving or you'd either float or sink. But we could go down to about 300, 400 feet. Nowadays, you go over a thousand. And uh, if you got uh, depth charged when you were at three, four hundred feet and the explosions were above you, they didn't really hurt you much until they got them below you. But anyway, a submarine, the front is the forward torpedo room, which has six torpedo tubes. They're all loaded and uh, two extras for each tube, so that was 18 torpedoes in the forward torpedo room. The next compartment was the uh, forward battery compartment, but the batteries actually were down in the bilges. And above that was officer's quarters and officer's mess and chief's quarters. Then behind that, the next compartment was the control room, which had all the uh, helm and the diving, all the manifolds for blowing air. When we were on the surface, our, uh, an airplane was our worst enemy. We had no protection against an airplane. So we'd have to dive as quick as we could. So when we come to dive, we had what they called a ball tank. They'd flood that. And they'd flood the negative buoyancy tank, and they'd flood all the ballast tanks. And we go down in a hurry. And the lookouts, and the three lookouts, and the two officers better get in. Because nobody waited. <laughs> and there was always water coming in before the hatch got closed. And then you go down to about 150 feet, and then they'd blow that uh, forward tank and level it off and then blow the negative tank so you wouldn't keep sinking. And then you'd have to keep moving or you'd, you had just like fins, you know, you controlled or up or down. Or, but anyway, that was all through the control room. Above the control room was the conning tower where the periscopes were. We had two periscopes. One was a very small scope for just looking. And a bigger scope was a radar scope, but uh, radar then wasn't very efficient, but it was some. So, you know, when, uh, when we were really looking for ships, uh, we'd ride on the surface and raise the scopes, and we had a long range. They couldn't see us, of course, then we could figure. But anyway, then behind the control room was the uh, after battery compartment, which the batteries down the bilges, and the crew's mess hall and the gallery, and sleeping for most of the crew. And the next compartment was two engines and equipment for making water and distilling water. The next compartment was two engines. And the next compartment was uh, what an electrical board was, control panel, which I was at. And behind that was the after torpedo room, which had four torpedo tubes and just one reload, eight tubes back there. And you know, a torpedo is about 18 foot long and has a warhead of, uh, I think it's 800 pounds, they call it Torpex, it was supposed to. And our torpedo is made to uh, penetrate and then explode. So they do, you try and get them as, if you think a ship is drawn 24 feet of water, you probably want to hit them about 20 feet down where you do all the damage. But, and when they fire a torpedo, 
on the tubes, they shoved them out with air, and you'd almost feel like a shotgun. You'd, you'd feel the kick. As soon as our torpedo left the tube, the tube had to been filled, had to fill up with seawater to compensate for the weight that just left, or else we'd pop to the surface, and then they'd have to pump that water and save it and reload the torpedoes. Usually sent out six torpedoes at a time because the ships are always zigging and zagging, so you had to send a pattern out hoping two or three might hit them. And then I slept in the after torpedo room, our bunks. I'll show you, we're right on top of the torpedoes. The only hatch that was ever open when we were at sea was in the conning tower hatch. The other hatches were never open. So if you had to go topside, which they wouldn't let you anyway, you had to go in the control room and up through the conning tower. But we, if you weren't in friendly waters, which we weren't very often, we didn't go topside. So we didn't see the sun or anything for many days at a time. I think that's probably why I'm a little goofy now. I don't know. <laughs> Join us next week when we continue Ken's stories about his experiences in World War II.